We're on a mission from God. Wendy? So I got that going. Darling? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Light of my life. We enjoy your films. I am a human being. I thought they smelled bad. On the outside. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in real time, analyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 40th anniversary of the release of The Hearse on June 20th, 1980. It was written by William Bleich, Bleich from an idea by Mark Tenser, directed by George Bowers, and released by Crown International Pictures. I think that's the first time I've seen From an Idea by... I'm also curious what that idea was, because even having seen the film, I have no idea. Yeah. But a car. A, <laughs> drives around. I feel like if you were if you came up with the idea for this movie, then you just deserve a co-screenwriting credit, because that's half of the writing of the movie. Or <laughs> because, story by. Yeah, nothing like, happened here. What is the concept? Because I honestly, like, when you described it at the last episode, I was like... Yeah. This movie isn't actually about a hearse or a car that doesn't even come into play until like three quarters of the way through the movie. Yeah, and she doesn't think that there's any connection to her aunt, and her aunt wasn't a witch. Like, they're just mixing up a bunch of weird stuff. But either way, Joseph Cotton replaced Martin Landau to play the uh, Pritchard character one month into production, Michael J. Fox style. So they'd already shot a bunch of stuff with him and then they went back and shot it with a different actor. Uh, this was the theatrical debut of Shooter McGavin, Christopher McDonald. We start with what I think is a vector graphic of the hearse, like this weird, like computerized pixelated graphic. It, it was very weird, but it's like a, a red line drawing on black of the hearse and it fades into the background and then the words the hearse pop up with this weird like stroby effect i have absolutely no member of memory of this yeah it's very strange it's an interesting shot for the beginning of the movie we get a lot of wide shots of san francisco and we meet jane hardy who is presumably a teacher and she is receiving some going away presents first from a student which is like a rolled up card and then a fellow teacher who addresses her as traveler because apparently she's going somewhere she's getting a pair of shoes as a gift and this lady is awful as they're walking to her car, she says, are you sure you're okay to fly away to some shitty hick town? Your mom just died and you just got divorced. It sounds like she's in a Texas Chainsaw Massacre type situation where she's she's inheriting a house and she's going to go stay there for the summer. Is that what Texas Chainsaw was about? Yeah, she's she inherited this house and she brought friends along to investigate the house. And then the Leatherface and friends are next door. Oh. Yeah. The first reason that she got called is because they came to town to see if her relative who owned the house was one of the bodies that had been dug up out of the cemetery. But that's a different movie. In this movie, she's moving out of what looks like one of the painted ladies, which no teacher has ever afforded rent in, let alone owned. She rolls out of town and she's weaving through the mountains for a while. She comes back to the coast to enjoy the sunset and just sit and drink from a thermos on the side of the road. Suddenly she's speaking to a man. We're hearing her talk, and I couldn't tell if this was going to be like, oh, we're just going to have voiceover in this movie. But it seems like she's sitting with a therapist. I don't know because we don't see this guy again. But she's talking to a guy in an office, and she says that she wants to leave town to get away from all the pain that she's dealt with lately. And he says, well, won't it still be here when you get back? And she says, I don't know. I won't know until I get back, I guess. She passes a sign in the black of night that reads Blackford City Limits. Moving through another dark intersection, Jane's car is sideswiped by a car with red headlights, or at least they look red in this first shot, but they don't they don't seem red in the rest of the movie. When she pulls over to exchange information, the other car just scurries off into the night. Is this the hearse? I don't know. It's, it's, <laughs> the movie's so poorly lit, I can't tell what car is yeah, what. Yeah, because also the grills of the cars chain are interchanged yeah. like now and then, so it's never it's not always the same car, but also it 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 brings up a point of does this ghost have an operational limit? Like, yeah. Is there, is there a barrier somewhere? Cause it didn't get her in San, San Francisco. Francisco. Yeah. So it's just like, as soon as she got in the town, the car was after her. It's like, aha, finally I lured someone here. 
Jane calls Mr. Pritchard from a payphone at a mechanic. She needs him to come meet her there with the key to the house. It seems like you would have called him in advance. Yeah, he should have known that she was coming to town this day. But I don't know if she planned on going to his house to get the key, but now that the car screwed up, she couldn't do that. Or put the key under the mat or something not sure or not plan to get into town at 11 o'clock at night (laughs) yeah as she turns to get the name of the place to tell pritchard where she is she locks eyes with this cowboy type man who is in a nearby pickup just watching her in the phone booth and uh, she's very creeped out by him the music is suddenly drumming and it sounds too much like someone banging on the glass of the phone booth uh Will it take you very long to get here, Mr. Pritchard? I was like, oh, did he, like, come over to talk to her? And it keeps happening, and she's not noticing it. And then I realized it was part of the soundtrack and not actively happening. She agrees to wait for Pritchard there, and she goes to sit in her car to avoid the creeper. Pritchard pulls up, and he shines a flashlight in her face, and he demands her name before he tells her to follow him to the house. She follows him to the house, and she seems creeped out as he steps towards the door. He notices that she's being weird and she says, oh, I guess it was just a sudden chill, which I guess that's what it was because we don't get any indication of anything being weird. Pritchard gets the lights on inside. Everything's covered in blankets like in the Changeling with the same actress. Yeah. Uh, There's even a music box later. Yeah. He says this is exactly as it was when your aunt died 30 some odd years ago, which it doesn't look like it's been 30 years. Like there's no dust. There's no cobwebs. It's literally just looks like he did this earlier today but in theory he's been the caretaker up to this yeah, point so i think he's been keeping it up you think he comes in here and wipes the cobwebs away every day well, for he, 30 years he well, does he does know that she was on her way there so maybe he went and cleaned up a bit maybe. And, and this is a house that he has been Left possibly yeah or well possibly been bequeathed we don't know he's probably been sure. living in it <laughs> squatter pritchard says that the house ought to be his and that her mother promised it to him even if that were true, I probably wouldn't bring it up so soon after her death unless I had like a signed contract to prove what I was saying. Well, and plus, why does he want it since everyone seems to want to avoid the house? Yeah. Like, like if he, he probably in, just wants to burn it to the ground. Yeah. I say, if he he should have just done that anyway. Yeah. If he lived in that house, no one would make deliveries to him. No one would want to do yard work for him. Everyone's yeah. like the house is what's causing the problem. The way he says it, it just sounds like he's trying to take advantage of her. And uh, I immediately suspected that this was just going to be a movie about him trying to Beetlejuice her out of this home. As she's exploring the house, Jane finds a sewing room and just totally falls in love with it. And then this is when she hears the music box again, like in the changeling. She follows the sound to a nearby bedroom. Doesn't question why the music was playing before she got in there, but she puts the music box on her nightstand. And in the morning, it has jumped back to the dresser where she found it. She puts on some running shoes and she steps out onto the porch, taps her stopwatch and starts doing some stretches when the front door just slams on its own. And it freaks her out, but she immediately comes to terms, oh, the door closed, okay, anyway. She investigates for like half a second before heading out on her jog. She is hit on by a couple of college-age guys this is shooter mcgavin and a friend and she just kind of waves them away but she's laughing about it she's she's taking it in stride jane works in her kitchen on something and then someone from the phone company knocks on her door but he's not in uniform and he's wearing sunglasses and a sailor's cap and a really thick mustache and right away she's acting like he's an old friend of hers Mm -hmm. It, it really confused me I thought that maybe the phone company line was like an inside joke between the two of them until he actually starts working on the phones. Yeah, I I think that she just wanted the phone connected. Yeah, but he looks like he's Dennis Quaid, like incognito. Like he's trying to sneak in here and they're going to play a joke. I I thought this was like someone else from the town screwing with her or something because he doesn't look like he's an employee of a company. Jane climbs a ladder to clean a window on the outside of an upstairs window and she notices a person in the attic while she's wiping the window clean and she panics and falls backward for a second but then the ladder swings back to the house and there's nobody in there now yeah, this this actually freaked me out a little bit not not the seeing a person but the falling backwards on a ladder yeah. because you know putting up christmas lights up on the the second story roof of my house i'm always panicked when i'm just like way up too high and it's like okay if i start to fall 
I'm gonna. I'm what just, am I gonna aim for? I'm gonna. I'm gonna grab the. Try to grab the roof. Just try to <laughs> grab the roof and dangle <laughs> and call for just help. Dangle and scream. <laughs> Those are your choices. She heads out to the hardware store where she picks up some supplies and she asks the people staffing the store for a recommendation of a handyman. The clerk says he doesn't know anyone, but his son blurts out, oh, how about Bo Rehnquist, Dad? And he says, well, we don't know anyone. Clearly doesn't want to help her. He doesn't want to involve anyone else. And the son says, well, Rehnquist is about a half mile down in the big red house. You should ask him. He's great. He can do anything. The clerk which is the the boy's father, tries to rush her out of the store, but he refuses to take her credit card. She asks if they can deliver the stuff to her aunt's place. You still got to pay for it. Yeah, it was like, (laughs) what difference does that make if I don't take a credit card? Are you saying you're going to have cash later so you can pay for it when I get there? That that is what she was saying. But it it just seemed weird um, that she's like, oh, well, then just deliver it. (laughs) When she explains where she lives, this is when the clerk and his wife share this concerned look. So they were already being jerks to her before they even knew that she lived in her aunt's house and this is 30 years later yeah like this town did they even remember what happened is he just like this to everybody maybe but he says we don't deliver that far and this is walking distance to the house the son asks the dad what his problem is and he refuses to explain for no reason to his son even when it's just the three of them in the store it's like wouldn't you want your son to know the reason that that you've decided not to communicate with this person like if devil if, worship house yeah if the if the point is that you think that he's going to get caught up in devil worship then tell him to stay away from the house and don't go to this woman something might have been avoided later is what i'm saying mm-hmm. as jane is loading her car outside a cop pulls into the spot beside her and it's jack denton the giant sheriff yeah <laughs> <laughs> my, my note was damn he's a tall drink of water yeah it was he's like a foot and a half taller than her when i saw him step out of the car i was like is this like a force perspective thing or is he actually <laughs> yeah, just yeah. huge and no he's just that big next to her but uh i looked it up i was trying to figure out what his height was and the actor's name is med flory and apparently he's also a celebrated jazz saxophonist trish vandeveer is 5 4 and flory is 6 5 but i'd have guessed six inches taller probably because she's like barefoot here and he's wearing big police boots and he's got a big hat on the sheriff asks how long she's in town and uh, if she's the one that he saw jogging this morning, he says, I'm not one to forget a pretty uh, face, if you know what I mean. She says she knows exactly what he means, and she leaves for Rehnquist's place. Rehnquist claims not to know any houses on Old Country Road, and when she specifies that it's the Martin place, even Bo's animals are pissed off about it. All the horses and sheep are like... Like Frau Blucher. (laughs) Yeah, don't help this person. And he suddenly says, oh, I'm too busy. And she's like, well, you just said. And he's like, yeah, I I said I'm too busy. Sorry. On the way home that night, she notices the grill of the hearse. This is the first time that I definitely recognized like an interesting looking grill. Mm -hmm. And uh, she just lets it pass her. And it does. So (laughs) it's not chasing her because it was just trying to get around her apparently. The next day, Paul, the kid from the hardware store, delivers her order and he offers to do the handiwork since Mr. Rehnquist was not much help. Paul tries to leave without the money for the things that he delivered, and Jane reminds him. And he says his dad would have killed him if he didn't come back with money. I'd be dead. Seriously dead. Not alive anymore. Mr. Pritchard needs a few days, on top of the 30 years he's had to prepare paperwork to hand (laughs) over this property. Well, I guess because it's been in her mother's name all this time. Her mom inherited it 30 years ago, and now... Her mom died, so she's getting it. Yeah. Sheriff Denton shows up as she's leaving Pritchard's office. After she leaves, they drink a toast to her just getting the hell out of town because they don't like her. That night, we have a POV through the windows of her house as a uh, kitchen sink spits all over her. Weird sounds are drawing her attention downstairs where the pipes are shaking violently. But she's walking around with a flashlight pointed at the ceiling following the pipes as they shake. And they stop just as she reaches this lamp where the ch- there's a chain wrapped around the pipes. Yeah. And I thought this was supposed to be a clue that someone's faking it. Like they just wrapped a chain around it and they were shaking the pipes on purpose. Or, or you know, like old pipes can shake sometimes with the vibration and they put a chain around it to emphasize. To stop them? No, no, or in order to emphasize the noise. Oh, okay. Like, so the pipe, they know the plumbing's bad, so the pipes will shake, but putting a chain on it would, would make, make it, it louder. Even louder. Yeah. But it doesn't seem like this is supposed to be a clue to anything because she just turns around and nonchalantly heads back upstairs 
where she's immediately spooked by Father Winston. Miss Hardy, please. Oh, you scared the hell out of me. I should probably take that as a compliment. <laughs> she recognizes him from a radio show that he does, and suddenly he goes dark. He gets really creepy when she's talking about the problems she's had with other people in this town. He says, Maybe the country's not the right place for you. And she's like, okay, anyway, uh, have a good night. Which is weird for later because he seems to be the only like genuine ally that she has in all this. Yeah, it's just it's just a weird moment from him where he turns and feels creepy and then the rest of the movie he's he's a helper. But it, I got a very Parker House uh, feeling from this mm. movie. Um, oh, yeah, totally. And I, I thought it was going to turn out that her aunt was like making – you know moonshine in the basement and mm-hmm. that's why everyone hated her and but that's not what's going on going through a chest later jane finds a bit of jewelry and she puts it on and she starts reading a diary entry about an upcoming wedding to a minister and plans to leave town the lights go out in the house and then suddenly high beams are pouring through the windows as the hearse pulls up outside the house doesn't do anything just the hearse is there we cut to the next day. This movie cuts to 12 hours later a hundred times. Yeah. It must have taken place over two years because <laughs> it's ridiculous <laughs> how often we go from day to night. The next day outside a liquor store, a little girl reluctantly speaks with Jane. Mommy said, I'm not supposed to talk to you because your house is haunted and you're a ghost. So this could have been a huge spoiler and it, the movie would have been more interesting, but she's not a ghost. She's just a lady. In a cemetery, she goes to find her aunt's grave. And as she's clearing the headstone of leaves, she is surprised suddenly by a man in a uniform. I thought it was a military uniform, but you were telling me it was probably just his chauffeur. Oh, yeah. 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 It's the same guy that we see multiple times it's, in this it's, movie. Right. But this the, is the, the first time. He's dressed like a yeah. chauffeur. Yeah. And he's got a big scar down one of his eyes. I don't think this is the first. I feel like we've seen a flash to him driving past driving her or hearse. something. Maybe. But yeah, he's he's got a big screwed up eye. Cut to 12 hours later. He's driving the hearse head on at Jane's car as she's heading back to the home at night and she swerves off the road to avoid him and gets stuck. Very quickly, there's another car here and it's Tom Sullivan and he's here to help her out. But I guess her car is so stuck that she literally needs a ride in his car. So he takes her back to her house and she notices a light that she hadn't left on upstairs. And so she says, will you walk with me to the door? And she goes upstairs to check the light and uh this guy that found her tom walks into her living room and is just like observing the the portrait of her aunt over her fireplace and he seems like hypnotized by it this this picture we see it many times i got i kept getting really confused by this picture because it looks just like her is yeah, it, it could a be, picture of her i don't know if it is or not uh, that's my note here was probably trish vandevere but i don't know like by the end of the movie i was second guessing that even yeah, I have no idea. We see visions of this ant in live action also, and it could be Trish Vanderveer. I don't know because it's so far away, it's hard to tell for sure. Well, because it's definitely her in the coffin. Right. Later. But but I don't right. know about this photograph or when she's sitting in the attic later. Tom offers to bring her back to her car tomorrow so just so that he'd have an opportunity to see her again. And in the middle of the night there's a there's a downpour and she's sitting up and reading more of her aunt's diary. She hears feet ascending the staircase, but it's not her feet. She hears someone approaching her bedroom door, and she catches it. Did you just say it's not her feet? Yeah, the, the thing that's been haunting her so far has been a hearse, so now it's apparently a ghost thing. Uh, she catches the door before whoever can burst in and says she has a gun, and then suddenly whatever's on the other side of this door you hear footsteps running away and a window can be heard shattering so someone presumably alive and scared of guns was on the other (laughs) side of this door yeah i'm assuming this is another incident of pritchard yeah it could be so many people it could be but now i'm just imagining like the cab from who framed roger rabbit just tiptoeing up the stairs stairs. (laughs) and banging on the door maybe i don't know what happened we never see the other side of the door uh We cut to 12 hours later, and uh, (laughs) Paul is fixing it, and then he's mowing the lawn, and he's hammering. He's doing a lot of work. Tom comes back with her car, so I don't know if he 
parked his car at his house, walked all the way to her car, drove it here, and now he's going to walk all the way back to his house. I think that's what's happening. She tells him she was shook up by the intruder she had that night, and she, he asks her on a date. So that night, 12 hours later, we get <laughs> a POV circling the house, and this is the second time now that we've had this POV. It's just looking through windows at her in the house again. But we get a really cool moment here. Yeah. Oh, my God. I, I had to rewind it like a bunch of times. I was like, what the heck is happening? Yeah. So the, the POV comes up on the front door, which is just, it's like a, a rectangular frame for a window. But there's probably not a window in this door. Mm-hmm. And the camera is coming up on it like it is a window, but then it passes through the window into the house. And you see they like pull a filter out of the camera yeah, so they can switch to the lighting for the interiors. But it's a cool moment because it feels very ghostly that you're just passing through this window into the house. Yeah, you've crossed through the membrane of the glass. Yeah. So this is clearly a ghost POV because nobody else in this film has been shown to have any powers of, of passing through physical objects yet or at all. We hear Jane in the shower as the POV starts to move upstairs and it walks right up to the shower curtain before backing away down the hall. So that was just for us, I guess. <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with her. It doesn't scare her. Uh, Jane slides the shower curtain open and gets dressed for her date. She hurries downstairs when she can hear Tom knocking at the door and he enters with a bouquet of flowers that he picked. And he says, I picked these at my place. Like he pauses for a moment. I really wanted like later in the movie for her to be at the cemetery and notice like the same kind of bouquet on someone else's grave. <laughs> like I just found these uh, at the cemetery. Um, I also like that their dates to me, like it's like a date implies yeah. dinner yeah, <laughs> no. or something. <laughs> I'm just going to take you out on a boat. Yeah. So the, he says he has a surprise for her and their date is literally in pitch black on a rowboat at night. Why, unless you're training a bunch of fish to sing Kiss the Girl. Like, <laughs> I don't know what the point of this this trip was. And it's scary. This is the, f- the first time that you've really got a chance to talk to this guy. Yeah. L- let's g- let me get you where you cannot escape me. Yeah. And he doesn't tell her much about himself, but she fills him in completely on her backstory. And suddenly she notices on the shore of the lake that the grill of the hearse has pulled up. And it's pointing headlights at them. And she freaks out a little bit. So is this the hearse? I think so. Why would the hearse be following him? Why does the hearse do anything in this movie? Because please explain it to me. Because I don't understand the motivation of any character in this movie. Wait, okay, so I, 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 I hate to get into the spoilers, but we're gonna because yeah, th- there, there's so many layers to peel back that don't get explained. Because he is the driver of the hearse. No. Right. Yes. Yes. No. They yeah. show they show it flip back and forth between the two of them. Yeah. Even though he's clearly not. They're two different actors. But is he, oh, he, okay, he, A, he's not that actor. And B, like we find out later who he is and he wouldn't be the driver of the hearse. He could have been. I guess he could have been. I don't know. Based yeah. on what Pritchard says later, I think well, he is. And what right, Pritchard says but, later doesn't make sense either. Okay, yeah. but if he is the driver of the hearse. Who's then, driving the car on the shore if he's in the boat with Yes! <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Okay, so once again, his motivations are super unclear because the hearse is trying to kill her. And is he, it? And he doesn't want to kill her. I don't think the hearse is trying very hard to kill her if that's what it's doing. I it's thought, just giving her love taps. It's never been... What is it trying to do then? I don't know. Just scare her? <laughs> I thought it was trying to warn her. I thought the hearse was going to be the hero of the story. Oh, God, oh my gosh. I don't understand. What that would be happening? an interesting turn. If the hearse was the good guy, and it was just like, no, 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 get out. Get out of here. Get out of this town. I'm trying to hurt to... my eye trying to protect you. Well, because it, like, captures her. Well, we'll get to... we're going to get to that scene. Yeah, it's that's coming That's a up. dream, though. Um, Is it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. So many, so many questions. Uh, she stands to point at the car. Tom slowly rises behind her, posed as if to attack. It was really creepy. Like she stands up and she's like, "There's a, there's a hearse over there," and he's like slowly climbing up behind her. Like he's like, "I'm gonna get her," and then he's like, "I think, uh, I think you should sit down. It's probably kids." And she sits down. And every time someone tells her that she's imagining it, she 100% agrees and goes completely back to normal. Like resets to where she was at the beginning of the movie. It's not like 
a building terror where it's like she's getting more and more upset over the course of the movie every time someone's like oh you're just crazy and she's like oh my god you are right i am crazy <laughs> she's like sammy jenkins <laughs> yeah she is 100 <laughs> percent. just just like oh you're right back to back to back to one and, yeah like um, nothing weird has happened for the entire time jane says that she wishes she could stay here forever because apparently she isn't put off by a routine home invasion and the palpable resentment of the entire fucking town <laughs> Tom tells her that the only thing permanent is love, which is a Frozen 2 spoiler and also not true. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Ouch. I cannot get this stain out of my shirt no matter what. (laughs) Uh, She invites Tom back for lunch the next afternoon. So he leaves and she reads more of the diary that night. Her aunt has fallen in love with someone named Robert and she loves him and fears him at the same time. And if he ever left, she would die. Suddenly the windows blow open to the house and she rises to fasten them but doesn't seem spooked by the sound at all and then it happens again but the second time she goes ape shit <laughs> at the window she's caught in the headlights of the approaching hearse and she just starts shouting out the window what the hell do you want? and she shouts to a driver that can't possibly hear her from inside a car downstairs what do you want? The man with a scar in his face is driving the car again, and he doesn't seem to react to her screaming. She grabs something off the porch and runs out of the house to attack the car, mm-hmm. but then the car backs up to the to where she's standing and opens, and then as soon as she touches it, she looks back at the upstairs window of her house and sees her aunt inside smiling down at her. Is that her aunt? I thought this was the woman at the church. No, I think it's supposed to be I, her aunt. I think it's okay. supposed to be her aunt. Because I get this woman in the church appears and doesn't play any part in anything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but um, also I, I will say this: this this part genuinely creaked me out. Because, yes, totally. Um, At the church, you mean? Well, no. Well, just just the the getting into the car. Oh yeah, it was very weird. Because I have dreams like that where like I can't stop myself. Like I'm being, from doing a thing. Yeah. Like I'm being drawn against my will into something. But it also just her movement when she gets into the car. Like, and, yeah. and it's also very poorly lit and probably not a great transfer that we were watching. Yeah, yeah. But like, it's almost as if she floats into this back of the car mm-hmm. and yeah. the door yeah. closes. Yeah, and it it closes right in front of her face, and she's like, puts a hand on the window, like she's like, I want to get out, but I'm paralyzed by this. Inside the hearse, we see her like banging on the walls on both sides of it but she's not making any progress obviously it, it's it makes the sound very akin again to the changeling of yeah. the kid banging on the tub yeah it's like a clanging like echoey sound but then the back opens and now the the car is at the the lake manor chapel the small church where the reverend works or the minister works i don't know is a reverend and a minister are they the same thing i don't uh, know um, i don't know walking through the church she sees a large number of just completely silent worshipers there's kind of a fog and a blue light in the church she locks eyes with one woman as she's walking towards the front i don't know if this is supposed to be her aunt or not again this is the woman who i keep thinking is her aunt because she keeps appearing in the house and in other scenes maybe maybe it is her aunt then i don't think they make it clear enough but when she locks eyes with this woman we hear the sound of a sword being unsheathed Like someone avoiding humanoids just dropped a shirt or something the sound happens again and this time with a look at an older gentleman at the front of the congregation mm-hmm. at the head of the church she finds herself in a coffin and suddenly so there, there's two of her in this scene she's looking at herself in a coffin and the her in a coffin opens its eyes and sits up and laughs inaudibly which is also this is a very creepy the face she's making is very disturbing when she's leaning up out of the coffin. Jane screams, but we can't hear this either. She, it's a muted scream, and she turns to run away in slow motion, and she gets out of the church and into the wilderness outside. Uh, in the woods, she runs headlong into the driver with the scar over his eye. She throws a hand over his mouth and suddenly sees herself in the back seat of the hearse again, banging on the windows and screaming silently from inside like she can't get out. This this looked very weird. I actually thought that the audio cut out of the movie at this point. So <laughs> I, I, it just didn't feel. It didn't fit. It didn't. It feel seemed right. accidental. Yeah. But after this, uh, her pounding on the window, trying to get out of the back of the hearse again, 
she suddenly wakes up in bed and she sits and cries in her bathroom for a little bit she takes some medicine to help her sleep cut to 12 hours later uh she's on the phone with her friend probably the one from the beginning that works at the school with her but we never really find out but she says that she's apparently just finished telling the story of her dream and yet has to insist that it didn't happen repeatedly even though what she describes in her dream could not have happened in real life she mentions tom and that he's kind of old-fashioned after she hangs up she turns over a child's drawing of a car going fast and we get this musical sting implying that this is important or means anything and she just sets it back down and walks away from it was like, this the drawing that the kid gave her at the beginning i don't even remember a kid oh, giving her a drawing. oh yeah at first well okay so the first time around oh i, I saw this scene i thought school? she drew it and now that you're saying this i was like oh yeah the kid gave her a drawing maybe it was like foreshadowing of all of this stuff that was going to happen that would be really weird if that's what it was supposed to be i guess it's possible where else did this drawing come from yeah i don't know but she holds it up and she flips it over and it goes like dun 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 like makes like a weird sound like oh my god look at this drawing this your, and this she, just, she jackie tree horned the drawing yeah exactly <laughs> but she just flips it over and puts it down like like she's lydia deets not noticing the maitlands doing something insane like she doesn't care at all what this drawing is it doesn't like have any it doesn't resonate with her and back at the hardware store the two guys who were catcalling Jane as she was exercising are now chastising Paul for not having slept with her yet. Uh, he tells them that she kissed him right as she's walking into the store. I don't remember them like her giving him a kiss before this. She gives him one later, but he might have been making this up. He gives her more stuff that she ordered, and she mentions that she won't need any help today, but she uses two excuses at the same time on accident. <laughs> she says that she wants to take a nap this afternoon and that she'll have company over. <laughs> so it's like, are you just telling him that you're going to screw this guy at your house? Or what do you, I don't understand why you said I have company. Don't come over. And I'm going to be asleep. Don't come over in the early afternoon. But she stops by the chapel and she sees the Reverend talking to the woman from her dream outside. And he explains it away and just informs her that, Oh, that locket you're wearing, it looks really nice where did you get it and she says oh i found it in the attic and he's like it's satanic you should FYI. probably put it away if if you weren't doing that on purpose you're not in league with the devil are you and she just like laughs like no <laughs> i'm glad you told me thank you as she starts her car to leave the woman in the church pulls open the chapel curtains and just creepily watches her drive away if this is her aunt it's weird that she's in so tight with the reverend here. no i think two different two different women yeah right but that's what we were saying is like is this supposed to be the aunt or not no no the one in the church is a different woman the one that keeps appearing in her house is her aunt yes yeah. we were arguing that maybe it could be the same actress before oh. we don't we can't tell because mm -hmm. i can't tell the difference between the woman in the attic or i can't i can't tell if there's supposed to be a difference between the woman in the attic and the woman in the picture like i'm pretty sure that's supposed to be her aunt but i don't know Jane sits at her dinner table with Tom, and she tells him about all the bizarre happenings. He encourages her to keep the locket because it's a beautiful heirloom, and not because he loves Satan. <laughs> he asks her a second or third time to consider staying in town, and a second or third time she says that she might. Jane is now in a robe, carrying towels through the house. Presumably Tom left at some point. None of these scenes actually have the chance to end. <laughs> but he's not here. And she's startled by Pritchard, who apparently just let himself in and was sitting in her living room. They argue for a bit about him being a dick and her wanting to know what the hell is going on. And he says, I know what your aunt did here. And she's like, okay, you can elaborate if you want. And then he says, you don't seem to be surprised at what I'm going to say. Which is not how surprises work. You don't get surprised about a thing that you haven't they heard haven't yet. They haven't heard yet, yeah. <laughs> but he says, you don't seem to be surprised at what I'm about to say. But a surprise happens after a thing, not before it. Is he literally mad that when he said that he knows what her aunt did, she didn't go, Abuh? What? what did my aunt, how could you possibly know what my aunt did? Because she doesn't know either. So why would she be surprised by that? But then he says, she was a devil worshiper. And she's like, oh yeah, 
I, I knew that. <laughs> like, that's not a surprise <laughs> to her at all. Somehow nobody in the town knows how she died, but they all know that she did die and that there was an accident afterwards. And she's like, oh, yeah, I heard about the accident as a child. And it seems that the words the accident are literally all that she heard because she's shocked to learn that the hearse carrying her aunt's body apparently drove off the Blackford Bridge and Auntie got a free cremation that the hearse driver and the body both vanished in the explosion. That they found metal, but there was no sign of even the coffin that she was in before. And Pritchard suggests that the devil took their bodies down to hell. And she accuses him of trying to spook her with the old hearse and kicks him out of the house. He tells her that she's beginning to imagine things and he leaves. That night she hears what sounds like a metal plate falling to the floor upstairs and she moves to investigate it. She finds a room where there's a breeze coming in because the window is open and it's just banging around some stuff that's hanging by the window. She picks up the diary again because she gave up on sleeping and when she gets back to the bed, she's terrified to find the hearse driver sitting in her bed. Somehow she didn't notice him until she had already sat down next to him. This next set of shots is so dark that it's really hard to even tell what's happening. I'm pretty sure that it's the driver, but it could be Tom, or it could be a corpse. I don't know what's sitting next to her in the bed. She moves to hide in a closet where the driver is there again. I think it's the driver every time, He and he surprises her from behind. And then... She closes the door to the hallway to stop and catch her breath, and then a hand bursts through it, Jack Torrance style, and grabs her around the neck. So this person is everywhere and seems to have impossible strength. She struggles for a moment with this home invader in her kitchen before she runs back out into the wilderness, which is one of her go-to moves is to just run into the woods. She gets to her car, and she gets it started and immediately notices that the hearse is following her, she comes skidding up to a diner that we haven't been to yet, and she frantically asks for help from the owner and the sheriff, who are both inside. I mean, it's it's open. It's operating hours. There's a bunch of people inside. And so you would think she would be safe here, especially with the sheriff. But uh, he keeps attributing all of her problems to her being a city woman and having city woman ways. <laughs> These city women are goddamn crazy. You know that? So she decides to go back out to her car to where the stalker is chasing her with a vehicle. The stalker reaches for her driver's side window. She peels away from this attacker, and we see his long shadow cast across the parking lot. She has now left the sheriff and heads to the equally disinterested chapel for help. The next morning, she realizes that she passed out in her car when the reverend is knocking on the window to wake her up in the morning. She brings the reverend back to her house to survey the scene, and miraculously, the punch hole in the door has been sealed. This kind of feels like Peter Venkman with uh, with Dana Barrett. Like, look at mm. all the junk food. She's, no, this wasn't here. None of this was here. There was a temple and monsters and flames. And I heard a voice say Zool. She starts crying that she isn't crazy. And the Reverend insists that it was a nightmare. What I see here, Jane, is nothing so much out of the ordinary and exactly what I expected to see. You had a nightmare. Produced by all that talk of the occult in the diary. I'm not crazy. I'm not. I said nightmare, Jane. He, he actually gives her really good advice. Like, this is where I start to come around on the Reverend. Yeah. Because he's just, like, describing, like, situations. And he says, you need to take care of yourself. And he says, look to yourself, then look to God. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, oh, this is this is actually like a, a kind moment. Perhaps I have misinterpreted his odd minister ways. Well, before. they they introduced him very poorly, though, if he was supposed to be an ally, because he says a lot of weird, creepy, intimidating things on that first night. Paul arrives just as the Reverend is stepping out. He brought her a flower. She gets it into some water, and she says, you can't possibly know what this means to me. Then she dares him to finish fixing her roof today like a parent would dare a child to get their shoes on in the next 10 seconds the guys that have been teasing paul catch him somewhere in town and ask if he's had sex with jane yet jane prepares for a dinner date at night when suddenly the lights go out and she says oh my god and then she lights candles and walks around the house to investigate 
She resets the circuit breaker and nothing is fixed when suddenly she sees a foot of someone else in the room. She has a candle very close to the floor and suddenly a foot steps right next to her. And she looks up, oh, it's Tom. Another polite misunderstanding that is for some reason not traumatic at all. They sit and eat dinner by candlelight. And after dinner, she reads some excerpts of the diary to Tom. He asks what she thinks of immortality. And she thinks that he's mocking her. But suddenly the window explodes into the room again. The two of them rush outside and Tom shouts at a pair of kids who have apparently broken the window and now call Jane a witch. So we have Pritchard and Paul and these kids and the Reverend and all these other people who hate her and we have no idea who's doing anything. Mm -hmm. And it turns out it's a combination of all of them. And I am on the ground of I don't think the Reverend hates her. I think he's just odd. Yeah, that's probably true. Because he comes in one last time. Yes. But af- after the kids call Jane a witch here, she makes this weird witchy grunt and gesture to scare them away. Witch! Witch! Oh, no! Witch! Witch! Duh! She and Tom arrange a dinner date for tomorrow. Apparently this isn't going anywhere tonight. It's starting to feel like rough cut. It's just two attractive people making the same dinner date over and over again with no foreseeable story cluttering things up. Suddenly they have sex. (laughs) It's the same 15 second piano score is playing over and over and over as the two of them are having sex in her room. And uh, the next morning though, she is alone. Paul shows up and he asks how the night went. And he asks if Tom stayed the night. And she says, I don't think that's any of your business, Paul. It seems like she won that bet about finishing the roof yesterday because Paul's still here. He invites her to a movie date. And he's very angry to learn that she is seeing Tom again and won't go on a date with him. And he breaks what he calls a vase. Mm -hmm. It's like a tiny little piece of glass. Jeez, that's it. Oh, damn it. He, like, punches the dinner table and knocks it over and it breaks. And he says, I'm sorry I broke your vase. And she says, look, it's fine. You just got to get some time to yourself you got to step away from me for a while you're too young for me and then she says where were you when i was 16 years old never mind don't answer that i don't want to know but to answer the question the actor playing paul is actually 21 not 16 but he still wasn't born when trish vanderveer was 16 (laughs) uh trish goes to bother pritchard at his office but he says he's too busy and she hands him a bunch of paperwork and says that she's going to be staying in town and he's very pissed off about it. He says that he talked to Paul, and he found out that she's been seeing someone named Tom. And I'm not clear if he thinks he can blackmail her with the information that she's dating a person, and that she's a <laughs> single woman dating a person. How dare you? Uh, she tells him that her personal life is none of his business, and that he should climb into his own hearse and drop dead. As she walks out, he phones someone, but I have no idea who. We never find out. The Uh, brick salesman, so he can buy some bricks. Oh, there you go. (laughs) To throw through the window. Bricks are us. Tom stands her up on her next date. She tries to call a couple local directories on the phone and can't find any information for him. So (laughs) here my next note is, tired of taking these notes, it's the same bullshit happening over and over again. She's on the phone talking to someone. Who cares? We get a POV outside of someone watching her again. Who cares? The phone line is cut, and the music seems to think that that's very exciting. (laughs) Another stupid window breaks. And then another one breaks. She goes outside again. It turns out this time that drunk Pritchard is doing it with a crowbar he's just smacking windows and breaking parts of her house because he just wants her to get out of town and she's not leaving on her own but she doesn't see him doing this she just no she runs runs away away. yeah after she runs away apparently he didn't drive here he walked here Mm -hmm. because he's trying to just flag down a ride on the road and the hearse comes up and crashes into him and kills him but i I like that jane like like his bad choice of words i like that she is freaked out again by windows breaking again thinking it's possibly supernatural when she we've already established that it was some kids before she's so scared that she drives away yeah her her panic response of everything is to drive away yeah 
So this is again where I'm questioning the motivation of this hearse. <laughs> what what is it what is its goal? The hearse is being driven by a Satanist who wants to lure other people into Satanism. I think that's the closest thing I can get to. Okay, I feel like that's a stretch. I I think we're we're reading into things because I don't know that I agree that Tom is driving the hearse to begin with. Well, we're going to get to that in just a moment. All right. (laughs) Paul leaves, I didn't get your message flowers on the porch uh, because he still thinks he's got a chance with this lady. And then he wanders into the house looking for her. He doesn't knock or anything. He just opens the door and goes inside and he starts shouting her name like, hey, where are you? I want to talk to you right now. But as he gets like three or four steps up the staircase, he suddenly turns around and we push into a freeze frame of his surprised face as he screams and is hopefully killed. Jane drives out to Tom's cabin and she the door's just open. She walks right in. The place is completely abandoned, has been for a long time. I'm not sure how she even found this place, but... Uh, yeah, I, I don't... I, I couldn't remember him saying where he lived or them ever going to a location like but there's so many him. scenes that we don't finish with the two of them that yeah it could be anywhere but she finds flowers and a picture of tom with her aunt maybe in a frame I, again i can't tell the woman is very nondescript outside the cabin she finds his headstone and realizes she's been fraternizing with a ghost but pritchard has already said they don't know what happened to him right but you can still have a headstone guess but but who would care who who cared enough to put it build a head buy a headstone maybe his family (laughs) but is he a ghost i i I think that he's the devil i don't think he's a devil i think he's a satanist but i thought he traded for he he tried to be immortal i thought that he traded his soul to be immortal i agree as a ghost that's what i as a physical person as a physical person which what bothers me then in that case why is this house abandoned? Like, I get that he supposedly died a long time ago, but Where wouldn't he, he still be living, living here? Yeah, that's what I was wondering. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, is it too suspicious if someone else comes to the house and they're like, the guy who lived here is dead. He shouldn't have all this stuff. Like, who just vacuumed in here? Guess he's living out of his car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. Like, there seems to be an operational limit to the spirit because shouldn't he have come for her earlier? No, he just, maybe part of the rule is that he can't leave town. Yeah. I guess that's yeah. maybe part of, part of the devil's deal was like you got to stay here this that's, is hell this town what? this blackford town. is hell <laughs> i still have a question though that we'll get to i guess later <laughs> but yeah the headstone says robert thomas morrison or whatever sullivan sullivan so robert from the diary is the same person as the tom that she's been dating she goes home and she explores her house she's calling for paul because she found the flowers outside and uh, she starts to pack up a suitcase because I think she's finally given up on Blackford. But here she hears the hearse pull up again. Who cares? Tom gets out and she hears that same metal unsheathing sound. And she grabs a knife. As she's exploring her house in search of someone, she's approaching the sound of running water in the bathroom. And she pulls the curtain open to find Pritchard hanging in the shower. Like, after they hit him with the hearse, they they hanged they him. They hung him from the shower head by his own tie. And she has no reaction to that. Right. She's just like, oh, that's not what I, I expected. I, did, I didn't like him anyway. I don't know what I thought was going to be in here. Uh, anyway. Uh, <laughs> He's <laughs> making another Beetlejuice reference. It's like when Alec Baldwin. Yeah, exactly. He's just like pushing him to the side to look at the clothes in the yeah, closet. they don't like the colors. Suddenly, Tom is halfway up the stairs and she's instantly frightened of him she's backing away explaining that there is no tom only robert she tries to hide behind the door to the closet and she notices that paul's corpse is in this closet and this one she's upset about she Mm -hmm. breaks down when she finds this body not the child tom breaks through the window and the door to this closet because every door in this movie has a window in it and reverend winston has a vision of jade in peril yeah he just looks up and goes Jane. yeah and then he <laughs> rushes to the to the place jane rushes back down the stairs and crashes into tom at the bottom of them even though she passed him at the top of the stairs and this happens over and over all around the house 
everywhere she runs she crashes headlong into him and finally the reverend pulls up to the house and jane tells tom this isn't possible and he says what if i could offer you immortality outside the reverend is basically trying to exercise the house yeah he like he casts an incantation and blows the door off the house yeah it looks really cool it like blasts into pieces because it it goes straight into the house and crashes into the the staircase and just explodes jane runs back out to her car again maybe even the same take we've seen three or four times already mm. and uh she notices headlights in pursuit again it's and, and tom the re- and the hearse yeah and, and the reverend says you can't fight him alone like right. he like he he offers to help. Yeah. And this is where we get the Scarface driver of the hearse driving, but then he morphs yeah. into Tom. It's yeah, cross cutting. Yeah. No, I I know that, but are are they like I don't understand what that means. <laughs> I I the only thing I can come to is that it's literally cross cutting to show you these two characters were the same person the whole time. Isn't that mind blowing? Yeah, but they're not the same actor. Right. And I don't like just when he gets immortality did he get a new face like but I don't so know when what's going on here that, that's possible i didn't consider that but when the hearse crashed earlier he was basically posing as the hearse driver so that he and her aunt could escape with their lives from this crash so they could live together on their own but the aunt are you saying the aunt wasn't dead yes but i don't know where she is that's part of what bothers me but she is dead and i thought but, the whole point of this was that he was trying to replace her because she wasn't strong enough because he says that at one point like she wasn't strong enough i think that she died in some sort of ritual that they were trying because they were trying to do the same ritual that they did on him that that got him e- eternal life on her she's like i'm gonna do i'm gonna do what he says and he's like she wasn't strong enough so she didn't survive so now he wants somebody else else to be that person for him but they said that her body disappeared from the crash site also where did that body go the devil took her (laughs) but didn't the devil take both of them that's what pritchard said i think the devil took her and that hearse driver but i don't think that tom was the hearse driver (laughs) he was he definitely was it doesn't make any sense but he definitely was according to the people who made this movie and apparently it's really easy to kill a ghost because all you have to do is blow him up yeah there you go as they're in another chase, another car chase, the hearse gives her car a little love tap. He swerves into her a few times from alongside her, and eventually he knocks her off the road. But she decides that this is her chance, and she's going to ram the hearse off the side of the road. So she rams it full speed, and it just bursts into flames right as it's about to fly over a cliff face. But just before she hits the car, Tom is looking out the window and smiles like Mm -hmm. this is exactly what I wanted. Yeah. And then the car explodes and falls off a cliff and explodes again. Back at home, a light turns on in the attic to reveal that the ant is waiting for someone. And then it turns off again. That's the end of the film. The end. (laughs) <laughs> what is happening in this movie? <laughs> Where'd the Reverend go? Did like I I, I did a screen grab. I, I, they're clearly do, two different act actresses, but this is the ant in the window at the end, and this is the woman looking out the window. Okay, so those are definitely two different people. Yeah, it's two. I don't different know where the ant went. That bothers me. I don't know where the Reverend went. I but, don't know why everyone in town hates her. I don't know why the hearse is chasing her or anyone. Why do they want to kill anyone? Why did it seem like Tom wanted to get knocked off the cliff? Why why would he have an alter ego of a driver? What was the purpose of taking her to the church? Like in the dream. Who was the creepy woman in the church? Who was the creepy woman in the church? (laughs) Does she go back to San Francisco after this? Or does she stay in town to face the murder charges? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> of all the people she definitely killed there's two dead bodies in her house someone's gonna ask like you say a car did this it's okay <laughs> yeah what there's a dead man hanging in your uh in your bathroom you care to explain this oh i didn't do that he got hit by a car that's why he's <laughs> that's why hanging he in a there. shower <laughs> and paul oh, well uh your car's pretty screwed up 
<laughs> you sure maybe you didn't hit him? No, no, no. Uh, an invisible hearse hit him. I knocked it off a cliff. It's over there. There's nothing here. There's there's no car here. Talk to the Reverend. He knows what's up. The Reverend vanished. <laughs> Where is the Reverend buried? <laughs> Tell us what happened. Where's our son? <laughs> the one who we warned against coming to visit yeah. you that you broke up with earlier today. Okay, so I'm going to say this. Is Tom a ghost? No. No, he is He's alive. He's immortal. Okay. He survived that car exploding. I'm confident. Okay. So then is the ant a ghost inside the house? Yes. I think the ant is alive inside the house. But immortal like Tom. Yes. I don't think so. I swear there's a line in there that said that she wasn't strong enough. So I feel like she did die. I thought when he said that she wasn't strong enough that he meant that she he didn't she didn't want to stay with him. Like, their relationship didn't survive this transition. And that's why the ant's trying to kill her. And, like, because he's like, he's like, I'm going to find someone new. Miss, I'm tired of your. Somebody who wants to devil worship. There are so but many scenes that could have been replaced with answers but to these questions. All, all, but all of the stuff in the diary points to her going along with this. Right. She but she also she... thought she was going to get to leave town and that they were going to be happily married somewhere. But it turned out they're doomed to Blackford forever. Based on that rule we made up. Who knows? <laughs> Be- well, because because this is the aunt, so that means the, the, her her mother is the sister, presumably. Yeah. Wh- and what- the sister was never drawn into this. Yeah, trap. never drawn into this. But why go after the sister or the niece? Why not just pick any other random woman in town? Mm-hmm. This guy could have seduced any of the women we saw in this whole town. And, and and there was, I mean, obviously we had the scene with the therapist, but there was another scene where Jane is like sobbing uncontrollably and saying it's happening all over again yeah like she had some other like breakdown oh i thought she was just literally crying about how the film the scene was being directed Uh. (laughs) what has been happening for the last three years apparently nothing nothing. and just but everyone's still terrified of the house even though nothing's happened in 30 years who was the who was the the was the preacher in the dream sequence the the guy she was the aunt was supposed to marry was it the same minister? It was definitely not the same minister. It was definitely, complete, definitely not. Was Tom the minister? No, In no, it was, it was like a different old guy. But I'm wondering if that was supposed to be the minister that the aunt was supposed to marry. I'm so and, confused. And would would she have gotten a, an actual funeral if she was a witch? I don't know. I don't understand how this movie. W- it was like two hours long and we didn't answer any questions yeah Yeah. it's a mess this was directed by george bowers (laughs) incredibly he has mostly editing credits uh (laughs) including money train the good son and from hell also a league of their own shoot to kill from the producer of brubaker and galaxina also buckaroo bonsai how stella got her groove back and deuce bigelow male gigolo so an eclectic mix. Uh, writer William Blyke, or Bleich, wrote nine episodes of the late 1990s Poltergeist television series. The idea here came from Mark Tenser. The only credit I could find from him was a movie called Coach, about a small town who hires a basketball coach named Randy, sight unseen, but bum bum bum, it's a woman. <laughs> and uh, he was also a producer for this film. Trish Vanderveer uh, was Jane Hardy. She's the wife of George C. Scott. We just had her in The Changeling with him. This is one of her rare appearances without him in this time period. Joseph Cotton was Walter Pritchard. He was in The Third Man. He's Jedediah Leland in Citizen Kane. He's William Simonson in Soylent Green. Great old man character actor. Mm -hmm. And he replaced, who did I say? Martin Lando. Yeah. David Gautreaux, who played Tom Sullivan. His only other interesting credit was he was Commander Branch in the first Star Trek movie. Okay. <laughs> the motion picture. I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, there's a lot of officers. There's a yeah. big ca- He's the a one that looks like a that, Satanist. So. <laughs> Donald Houghton played Reverend Winston here. He was Dr. Lowell in a movie called The China Syndrome that Richard has not seen. <laughs> he was also General Tide in Dances with Wolves. Med Flory, the giant saxophonist that I mentioned before, was Sheriff Denton. He plays Warzuski in the original Nutty Professor. 
And he's also in a lot of Western shows like The Virginian, uh, Rawhide, the theme for which was performed. Bounty Law. <laughs> yeah. But he, he was in Rawhide and they performed the theme in the Blues Brothers movie that came out the same day as this movie. He was also on Maverick. Donald Petrie played Luke. He was the director of Mystic Pizza, Grumpy Old Men, Miss Congeniality, Richie Rich, My Favorite Martian. He's also a CSUN alumni, and his first ever directing credit was for Trumbo's World. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is a classic MacGyver episode about killer ants. Christopher McDonald was Pete here. Pete and Luke are the two guys that are hitting on Jane and giving Paul shit about not sleeping with her. Christopher McDonald played Shooter McGavin in Happy Gilmore. He's also Jack Barry in The Quiz Show and Travis Cole in Dirty Work which is one of my favorite <laughs> roles from him. <laughs> Perry Lang played Paul Gordon. He's a director in his own right. He just directed a movie called An Interview with God with David Strathern. That's one of those uh, faith-based movies. I think you caught me watching it the other day because for some <laughs> reason I enjoy watching those movies from time to time. And it's just amusing. He also has a lot of TV direction, mostly Weeds recently. He did a lot of episodes of Weeds. He also plays Kelly in Alligator later this year. Fred Franklin was Mr. Gordon. That's the guy who runs the hardware store. He was Ashcroft in the Fog earlier this year. I could not remember who Ashcroft was. And he's also back later this year in The Kidnapping of the President. Chuck Mitchell played the counterman. That's the guy who is running the diner. And that is the guy who plays Porky in the Porky series. Oh, okay. Uh, and he's also the pornographer from Don't Answer the Phone, another Crown International picture. Tanya Bowers plays the schoolgirl outside of the store that wasn't supposed to talk to uh, our lead, Jane, here. Presumably the daughter of director George Bowers. Uh, I have one correction to make. Sure. This film is actually uh, an hour and 40 minutes long. It just feels like two hours. Is it really? More. Yeah. I had to watch it in like four sittings. It just took me forever. Every time I watched like 15 minutes, I was like, this movie's got to be almost over, right? It's like, ugh. Well, that's the other thing that was frustrating for me on a on a note by note basis is that so little is happening, but so many things are happening. Mm -hmm. So it was always like, oh, uh, the sink is squirting water on her and now we're back outside and now she's going upstairs and she's closing a door. And it's like none of it matters, but so many things happened. Mm -hmm. It's very frustrating to keep track of. Yeah. So, Patrick, up or down? This is a big down. It's a down. I, I'm just so confused. <laughs> this is the worst horror film we've had all year. I, um, the worst? Uh, yes. No, I disagree with that completely. What horror film would you put below this? Um, I would put all of them below this one, pretty much. You would put The Fog below this. Is that a horror film? Yes. I don't know if I would consider The Hog a horror the hog a horror film? <laughs> the hog a horror Is film. this a horror film? They're both about ghosts chasing people. Okay. All right. Well, I would definitely put Don't Go Into the House, To All Good Night, Death Ship. You would put Death Ship really? below this? I would rather watch any of those movies than this one again. Yeah. Wow. You really liked this movie. <laughs> <laughs> those are all really low on my list. Yeah, but this deserves to be below them. That's crazy to me. I would put effects below this, but I know you have a weird fondness for that I one. liked effects. Effects well, had don't some answer smart the, metal Don't stuff. answer the phone is way down at the bottom of my list. Yeah, this goes below that also. I, I would rather watch this than don't answer the Where's phone. Where's this going on your list? We we all agreed that it's a down. I'm going to put this between To All A Good Night and Death Ship. To All A Good Night and Death Ship. Okay. Jess. Oof. Um, you know, I think I'm going to put this above the children but below the private eyes okay i am putting this above up the academy and below the happy hooker goes hollywood which is fifth from the bottom of my list this movie was awful i wouldn't put my worst enemy through it because nothing redeeming happens and there's nothing interesting to it and that's all there is i think that's everything for this one if you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd, where, as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at VintageVideoPodcast.com. Please consider rating us on iTunes to help people find the show, and if you take the time to leave us a review, we will thank you personally in an upcoming episode. If you're feeling especially generous, you can support the show through Patreon.com slash VintageVideoPodcast. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time 
when we'll be discussing another show about a haunted vehicle. Herbie Goes Bananas, which IMDb describes like so. The adorable little VW helps its owners break up a counterfeiting ring in Mexico. We leave you now with the trailer for Herbie Goes Bananas. Here comes a brand new Herbie. It's dynamite. The love bug goes south of the border. The hard way. In Disney's all new Herbie Goes Bananas. It's Herbie with all new styling. I've never seen anything like it. All new performance. <laughs> Running circles around the competition. Taking on a gang of gold thieves. 700 miles on a banana boat with wheels. I think he's trying to chew it off. Get him! They're taking the gold! Cloris Leachman. I think he wants to tell us something. It's a car woman, not Lassie. Harvey Corman. And Disney's top banana, Herbie. A car that drives everyone bananas. Herbie goes bananas.